Oh, there we are. Okay. I'll show you both of our images. We are on. Okay. Hi, this is Keith with How to Build One Home. We are still running some great fun technology. I'm at a network meeting, so if you're a little loud, you can forgive me. But I wanted to start off with. Yeah, sure over there. Maybe maybe put it on the I want to start with a really interesting question. And it has to do with location, location, location. All right. And why that is something that a lot of times owner builders don't consider or they don't know how to factor that into the building of their own home and why location is kind of important. A couple of things. I've lived in three of the fastest growing cities in America, three of them. And I've seen things change faster than you can shake a stick at. And what happens is, is a lot of people don't see what's coming. And I'm not just talking about fast growing cities. I'm talking about cities and urban areas that are also collapsing before your eyes, while some are just, you know, bustling and growing pretty quickly. Well, when you're when you're building something, you're building something permanent. It's going to have a permanent foundation. It's not going anywhere. And so you need to think how it fits and how it's going to fit within the changing dynamics of the culture and the environment where you are now building or where you want to build. A couple of things I've thought about over the years. I love, in fact, if I had my druthers, it'd be really fun to do this. I'd like to go to Detroit and I've seen a lot of just communities that are just absolutely run down. And I'd love to just go in there and pick three random homes, not next to each other, but just three random homes one block here and one block there and another block there and literally restore the homes to their highest and best just for the fun of it. Something happens, something dynamic happens in that community. You start lifting the community. They start feeling like, Ooh, man, I'm, I'm in a really cool neighborhood. I'm, I'm, these people are building, repairing this home and they're bringing it up and all that kind of stuff. That's what construction does. Even if it's a restoration, or a new construction, You're, you are going to lift your community. Now ask yourself, where do you want to lift? You're going to lift the economics. You're going to lift something. You're going to lift the perception, the hope. You're going to lift a lot of people by the mere fact that you're going to dump several hundred thousand dollars into the construction of a new home, right? And you have to ask yourself, will that environment receive the energy that I have? For example, I, my wife and I bought an old pioneer home maybe 15, 20 years ago. And before we bought it, the, the neighborhood was really starting to collapse. Um, the house that we bought, the windows were broken in, cats and dogs were living in it. Uh, just like the Ghostbusters um, phrase, cats and dogs living together, how hell's breaking loose? It was bad, it was really kind of a rundown part of town. Well, we went in there and totally gutted a home, totally restored it, put in upstairs in it without changing the footprint, did a lot to it added another 1700, 1,700 square feet on the back end of it. Then we added a huge garage with a, an apartment behind that on top of all that. It went from literally, you know, 160,000 to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in value. Well, kitty corner from us, a uh, house, new house was put up, old house was bladed. Just down the street from that, an old house was bladed and a new house was put up. And now it's a, it's a part of the community where a lot of people want to be. In fact, I know people are knocking. Do you know anyone who wants to sell a home? I'd love to just restore or build a new home in downtown. And so that's that's the opportunity you have. You you can have an opportunity to create more equity, more value to your home if you're really aware of how it's going to lift the community and what it might trigger with other people in the community. So location, location, location. If you're just going to buy a piece of land that's 25 miles out, out of town, and uh, maybe on five acres and there's nobody around, you may have less of an impact. But if you're gonna buy maybe a, a mile or two outside of town, and there's a lot of other people building there, then you're all building each other up. But if you go right into um, an older part of town that could use stuff like that, you are going to lift that community, whether you like it or not, you're gonna do it. So you might wanna find out people that, that live there, how long they live there. For example, I live in a community where it's for the nearly newlywed and the nearly dead. So we've got a lot of people that are retiring and, and dying and some people that are brand new and having kids. It's that kind of huge diversion. I'm stuck right in the middle. I'm not really at either one of those ends. 
And so it's been, it's been very interesting to see the dynamics and the effect of building and restoring a home and building new in an old part of town. Think about that. Don't be um, uh, unaware of it, but just consider that when you do build a home and when you're going to dump a lot of money into it, you want to make sure it's going to kind of hold its value. You want to make sure that it's not going to be just a fall apart. And so that's a real, real something to consider. I've not even put that in my home site selection checklist. Should add it there, but it's something I wanted to kind of reiterate and let people know that it's important. Know where you're going to dump a lot of money and make sure that that, that environment's going to hold it. The reason why I brought that story up with Detroit is because I think if you had a community and there's three homes kind of close together and you totally restore those, it would lift that community phenomenally. It happens. It does it all the time. I've seen it happen quite a bit. If you live in fast-growing communities, there's a lot of change. That's another dynamic. Everybody wants to move out to the new area, to the new area. And I lived in Southern California for many, many years. And I saw people buy in the first phase. And when the second phase is getting ready to sell, they would sell in the first phase and move into the second phase and move into another subdivision. They kept moving out, moving out. And as a result, I saw podiatrists and dentists and pediatricians have to take their business and move it to the outskirts of town and move it further out to Barstow or Bakersfield or somewhere further out because the culture changed so much that homes got to be so pricey that the new families couldn't afford them. So those who had businesses that serviced young children or families had to follow that growth. So you, if you're young or if you're older, think about how things are going to change over the course of 5, 10, 15, 20 years and how that's going to affect the valuation of your home. This is really long-term thinking. And when you have that long-term thinking in place, then you can say location, location. This is going to be a good location for now, and it's a good location next year. And in 15 years or 20, it's going to be an even better location. If you can think like that, all power to you. I, I wanted to give that heads up to people. Anyway, a couple, couple questions here. Um, this is a question from Nerimans on why. Did I, Sanwari, I hope I said that right. She asked a question. Do you have insight guidance on how I should create partnerships with builders or developers? You don't want to make a partnership with a developer if you're just going to try to build a single home. However, with a builder, here's some interesting things to consider. If you're really scared about being an owner builder and you want some help, the most important help is at the excavation, foundation, and framing stage, really. And I met a, a pool guy a couple of years ago, and I was looking to put a, a pool in for some clients. And he said, to tell you what, you can manage this yourself, Keith. You're a general contractor. By state code, you can literally install a pool on your own as a general contractor. And he says, I will give you all the people you need, my Shock Creek crew, my rebar crew, the excavation crew, uh, the the plaster uh, crew and the final finish crew and all the coping that would take place. Five different subcontractors. Most people don't know that a pool installer actually hires out a lot of subcontractors to build their pool. So he says, I, I'll give this to you for $500. I said, that's not a bad price. I ended up not needing it, but I, I have that in the back of my mind. And I actually gave that to a landscaper friend of mine. And he went and built his pool and, and bought all this that full list of contacts from this excavator that I know. So you may want to approach a general contractor, even a builder and say, Hey, um, are you willing to release or give me some contacts? I'll pay you, I'll pay you $300 if you give me the best contacts you have. And it's provided this builder's in the business and he really is connected with a lot of people. You don't want to go with someone who's retired who hasn't been in the, the loop for five to 10 to 15 years. That contact list may be toast. So you want a contact list of the best people they'd recommend or even ask them, would you be interested in just a mentoring me? Uh, that's what I have was a GC package. But if you can get a mentor in your area who's a general contractor, all the better. The students that I mentor do the best than when they're within my region because I give them all my contacts. I mentor students outside my area and they don't have, I have, to, I kind of have to guide them on how to find good subcontractors and what, how to read the, the, in, the, the estimates and bids and stuff like that. 
So making friends that way, networking, and again, we're at a networking meeting here, and it's not who you know, it's how you get to know who you know. And you might even want to think about if there's a builder association in your area. If there is, there's nothing stopping you from being a member of that builder association. I've never known a, a, an association to tell somebody you can't be a member. Well, you're about ready to dump several hundred thousand dollars. Of course, it'd be an awesome thing for them to have you as a member because now you've got painters and, and plumbers and all kinds of different subcontractors in that association that you can call upon and get access to. So I hope that helps you long way of answering this. It's a great question and it needs to be discussed a lot. So. I think it's not recording. I got kicked out. You're you got kicked out? No, I'm not frozen. I can hit end stream up here if I want. So I'm not kicked out. So I'm continuing going. So as you see up here, I can end stream if I need to. All right. Uh, let's go here to would I see the same comments come up if they come up, new ones? Okay, I won't worry. I'll keep talking. Um, let's talk about networking to go off of what Nariman was asking. A lot of owner builders don't know how to just knock on the door. And I've mentioned several times that if you are the type of person that is constantly um, talking too much or uh, revealing too much about yourself, like you don't want to tell subcontractors that you're funded and how much money you have. You don't need to, to say that. Um, what you do need to do is get to know as many people as you can. Get out there and, and, and ask questions and network. Here's what's really, really challenging. So 15 years ago, you could go on to YouTube and Yahoo and all these places, and you can type in plumber my little town and you would see a page page and a half of actual links to plumbers now you have to go to data aggregator sites and those data aggregator sites like angie's list and house and all these different sites now you have to some of them make you pay to even see and get access to some of these people that's why it's really hard to network online it's more difficult now than it ever has been however i belong to a couple of facebook pages and they're like, um, mine is called St. George Local, okay? And you can post anything you want on there with regard to asking questions about who do you recommend for a plumber? Who do you recommend for a bike repair person or whatever it may be? And you'll get two, three, four different responses. And these are people that know people in the community that are offering their services for a fee or, or, or what have you. That's one of the best ways. That's just right off the cuff really simple get out there and get get me known and, and then find those facebook pages and they're called uh your town something local or or, or even a, a kind of a classifieds ads those are also good to look at uh, craigslist is another one I've, not as many people get on craigslist as much a lot of people get on facebook marketplace and they're always asking questions so check that out just the more you get out and know Pretty soon you'll find out, like in my town, there's four different garage door installers in town. It took me about a, a year to figure that out and why garage doors take so long to install. Because there's only a few. But plumbers, wow, there's quite a few. And right now plumbers are, are looking for work. Garage door st installers, they're still behind because there's so few of them. So once you get out and find how many there are, you, you will quickly realize how many framers there are, how many electricians there are in your community. Sometimes you may run into 20, 30, 40, 50, or 100, whereas in other communities, it may be three, it may be two. And if you're in a community with fewer, you're going to find them out pretty quick. And that, that, the best way, to, again, is just to start networking, asking questions out there. All right. Um, yeah, give some thumbs up on the, the live stream. That'd be awesome. Uh, I have another video coming out, and it's going to be coming out next Thursday, next Tuesday. It's with the Economic Ninja. I interviewed him in Dallas, Texas. He actually gave some really, really good advice uh, with regard to the economy and where things are going. So please look for that. It's coming out next Tuesday. And it was a really, really great interview, so look forward to that. Uh, a lot of other posts. I'm doing new construction restoration and rehabilitation and remodeling jobs all three of them i've got going right now 
and you'll find when the economy waxes and wanes like that, there's less new construction. There's a lot of restoration and remodels, but I've got all three of them going right now. So it makes my, my scheduling really, I had one subcontractor message me, Keith, we really need to, to dial you in because your scheduling's off and we don't know how to work around that. And I go, that's because I've got all three of the different types of uh, build jobs you could ever imagine and major, major remodels. I mean, we're talking remodels that are hundreds of thousands of dollars and then major restorations and, and they're the hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, in their repair and then new construction as well. So it, 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 it really affects your schedule. So if you're doing restoration or if you're doing remodels, uh, stuff like that, just keep in mind that it's a different scheduling. It's a different beast <laughs> altogether. And uh, the more you can talk with people to find out how long it's going to take to do something, either as a remodel, because you're going to gut demo first before you can actually see what's going on behind the scenes, that's, gonna, that's a different beast than it is new construction. New construction is much easier to schedule than restorations or remodels. And I've got all three of those going right now. And so watch for the videos to come. Uh, a lot of new posts on a major Pioneer home that were actually I had delivered to my home today. Major 20-ton jacks, four of them. So we're, we have jacks that are going to lift 80 tons into the air, reset the entire Pioneer home on a, a new stem wall, and then start reframing it and fixing it from there. So... <laughs> That's not been an easy one to schedule. It's been really, really challenging to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> market update. I'm going to do a little information on market update. And that's going to be on that video. This is what Alex is asking regarding the interview I had with the Economic Ninja. He says to watch the bond market. And and I, I actually really, really believe that what Travis is saying on the Economic Ninja. He's saying that interest rates are going to go up and they can go up as high as 10% next year. And there's reasons for that. That's why I say to follow his channel. We're really tagging each other quite well. And he's got two channels. One's called uh, the Real Estate Ninja and the other one's called the Economic Ninja channel. Just type into both of those on YouTube. And he's got his boots on the ground. He is sniffing out stories and sniffing out what's going on. But he's also looking at geopolitics. We're entering into a war situation. You never know what that's going to happen. But what I do know is that oil prices are going up. When you go into a war cycle, this affects the price of oil. And what does that do? It affects the price of materials because it now has a greater transport cost to get heavy materials from, from A to B. So that's going to affect the price of, um, of things as well. So if you're in that situation where you're, you're, Permitting, I'm in the permitting phase on two builds right now. I'm moving fast on that because I actually want to lock in some prices as soon as I possibly can. January's coming around. That's also going to be a, it's oftentimes a, a tick up. Sometimes suppliers will hold out on January and they will wait for prices to increase in July or they wait in fall. But sometimes it's twice a year, sometimes it's three times a year. But I would look for a price tick, a tick on heavy materials like lumber and concrete. They typically go up on the 1st of January. All permitting prices, all permitting fees typically go up the 1st of every year. So I'm in the process of getting two permits on two builds, and I want those permits done before the end of the year. So I'm kind of hustling to get that. And if you're in that same situation, hustle. And just because you have the permit doesn't mean you have to break ground. It means you have the permit. And every state that I know of and every jurisdiction if you need another six months past the initial 12 months, you've got it. But guess what? You've got that permit. I I know my permit fees increase $500 to $1,000 every year on the county. And the water fee locally, it it's all, it's built in, it's baked into the cake that they're going to increase their fee $1,000 every year. So if I can get that done now between November and December, I can save on some costs. Those are market updates. Those are real things you need to be aware of that can affect your pricing and your budgeting. And if you're aware of that, you're, you're going to be on top of that. Uh, question, uh, let's see. Let's see. Hunter, building two homes out in Erda, Utah. Erda, where is that? I know where that is. Is that by Tuola? I think it's by Tuola, Erda. I'm having, I, I, I used to live in Tuola. It's a bedroom community. 
I'm having troubles getting excavators out to the site to do some work. I keep getting getting put on the back burner or delayed and delayed. Is that a walkout basement? How deep is the excavation? Um, I would go to not call excavators, but go to jobs where you might find some excavators and find out, hey, I, I've been trying to get some excavators. Are you free to, here's my engineering. You need, they, need to, they need to know how complicated it is. Is there a lot of rock and boulder on the job site? Is it terraced? What's the elevation necessary for it? Is there going to be a lot of clean fill? And a lot of excavators, if they can see that, that's eh, that's not a bad job, I'll, I'll take it. But if they don't know, but you can help communicate to them that here's the actual facts of the job site, here's the design, here's the here's the building pad where I want to put it, and here's my geotech report. And if you have those things, you can give that to them, they may be able to jump on it. If you were closer here, I could give you some excavators, but all my excavators are a couple hundred miles away from you. But again, get out there and talk around. There may be an old timer in town who's got heavy equipment looking for work. I'm serious. I seen I was up on a mountain at a job, and there's an old guy living around the corner, and he's got a, a tractor out, out out front, and he finally put a sign on it for hire. But he's not got a Facebook page. He doesn't have a a, a contact list, or he doesn't have a website. And you're not going to find him online. These are things you have to be aware of. So as you're driving around, you're going to see guys with tractors and trailers. You're going to see people with businesses on their cars, but they may not even be online. I know framers, two of the best framers I know, have no web presence at all, none. I had to find them through networking and through word of mouth. So keep that in mind when you're looking for excavators out there. SM asks a question. What kind of license designation in state license board is for finished carpentry? That's typically handyman. Uh, uh, it could be something else, but more than likely it's a handyman or cabinetry. Uh, look into your state licensing and find out. Here's the problem, though. If they go under a handyman licensure, then they're limited on how much they can actually bid. Like a cabinet installer, they can bid up to thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars for a whole new cabinet for a kitchen. Well, a handyman can't do that. They're limited on the amount of money that they can actually bid out because they're not really uh, regulated. They're regulated on how much they they can't even subcontract. So I don't know what it would be in your state. It could be uh, um, all kinds of different designations. I know they're not a general contractor. That's that would be a little more costly for them to get involved in. But you can, you can find out by talking to the uh, permitting office, the local permitting office, and ask them what would be required for a carpenter, what's, what's basically required in the state. So your local permitting office would help. Make friends with those people in those offices. That would be very, very helpful to do that. Uh, question, Ricky Sherman, what does a structural engineer need to, to do his job? He needs architectural plans in a CAD file. That's why I tell people do not buy plans online because if you buy plans online, you don't have that vector file. And I've seen a sad, sad story, but I've seen a lot of owner builders buy these plans and they give them to the, to the engineer, but they're in a PDF format and he can't do anything with that. He has to redesign the entire uh, architectural designs, everything, so, so he can put them into his CAD file. You can take plans, ideas online, floor plans you can take those off of online and you can take that to a drafts person and have them fix it the way you want tweak it the way you want and then he's going to take that vector file which is a cad file and he's going to give it to the structural engineer they need that because then they're going to start doing structural plans from those 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 vector files so um as a side note to that because you really started getting me thinking about I had a student email me today or two days ago and they were stressed because their MEP engineer was not getting things done. And it was just wait. They've given this MEP engineer uh, thousands and thousands of dollars. I'm going to tell you something. You do not need an MEP engineer. That stands for mechanical, electrical and plumbing. All that is designed ad hoc on site during the course of construction for residential. You only need an MEP engineer if you're doing commercial or if your home happens to be 25,000 square feet and it's just a monster of a home and you've got the money and it doesn't, it's not bad to have those 
those designs, that engineer on board. However, I've never seen an MEP engineer really be worth their, their weight in, in anything because it's costly. Your architectural drafts person or architect will include the electrical in their, their design. So the electrical plan is going to come with that. So you don't need the electrical. So all you have, to have is mechanical and plumbing. Well, plumbers are, are stuck with what they're going to do. Their, their, their quarter-inch bubble, bubble slope is, is what it is. You can't get away from that. Where, it's, where your septic is, that's where it's going to be, Septic if you have a septic. So you really don't need that. And the mechanical, I'd rather have a good HVAC contractor design my mechanical and not an MEP engineer. How much do they really know about flow rates and, and, and PSI and all kinds of stuff with air circulation and recirculation? And how often does the, does the room recirculate? I, I just don't know. I, commercial is the only way I'd put a MEP engineer. That was a, that was a tough email I got this week from a, from a student. A question from David B. If you want to know what's coming, just look up the history of Jimmy Carter area. This will be very similar to then. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. He was stuck with an Iran issue, a Middle East issue, uh, when he was president as well. So who knows? Oil prices could go up. I remember we had huge long lines at gas stations during that time. That's kind of dating me. But when you start seeing that, you, it's going to affect prices everywhere. Uh, Chad asked a question. Uh, is adding a suspended slab under the garage a good idea, or is there potential for too many issues? That's a very good question, but that's really a commercial uh, technology. When you go through um, garage floors and you're, uh, where you're driving up to park your car in a garage stall, those are often uh, done in this, with the same technology. It's a corrugated, huge, thick metal, and they, they, they put it across, and then you have a crawl space or even a basement underneath, but you pour your concrete underneath that. It just requires a lot of engineering. And you've got to have people that know what they're doing to use the, the materials they need to make that happen. Um, I've seen, well, I've seen concrete crack more that way than any other way because it just wasn't stabilized properly. And especially if it's a big garage, you're limited on how much of a span you can make with that. Uh, I've, I've seen them done up in north when I was working in Park City. We did a couple of uh, garages that way. But it's really hard to get a, 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 a positive slope out of the garage. Typically, those are done on a flatter plane. So I'm not a fan of them. I know you have to do it because the design demands it or you're cutting into a hill and this is the only way to put in a garage. If that's the case, then you find some, some people who know how to install that. So... Some good contractors, concrete contractors who are familiar with commercial construction would be very, very good to help you out with that. Uh, Tzir asks a question. What are your thoughts on HRVs and ERVs? The Build Show recently had an interesting video on HRV and mini split situation. Um, a lot of that is this, this, this drive to just seal up a home to such a degree that now you have to have um, air replacement. And that air replacement is pulling air from the outside. And that's why I, I'm not a fan of sealing up homes. I know they're going for like this zero emission type thing in a home. And some people have such health issues, it's a demand. Like we have a community out west here. It's called, uh, what's that community called? And not Entrada, but further out. Kayenta. A lot of those people literally moved here because they cannot handle pollutions in the air. They can't handle dust. And so they have a lot of that in their in their homes. And then in Colorado, they have to install that because they've got radon gas coming up through the earth. And so they've got to recirculate the air in the home. And I'm not a, I'm not I'm not against that. I think that's a really plus thing. I just like to do it with, by opening the window. That's just me. I'm, I'm old school. It helps with the house a lot better, unless you're in some humid environments and it's a nightmare. Uh, I got to do more on that. Um, it's the problem is is that I, uh, the other shows deal with very very expensive homes, where these homes could be north of three to four hundred dollars a square feet, 
or even higher than I built homes north of $1,400 a square foot. And then it becomes, let's add everything we can. But I deal with a lot of clients that need to get their price down below $300 a square foot. So ERVs and HRVs are not even a thought. It's just one thing we don't even include. So that's why I haven't tapped into it. I really focus on that type of uh, cost per square foot. Uh, for the most, that's about 80% of my bills are in that arena. The rest of them are, are higher end, but they don't even, they're not interested in that. They're, they want the outside air coming in. So question by Herschel. Hello all, new to your channel as of today. Great, welcome of all. The wife and I are looking to start our first build next year. Great. Uh, it'd be nice to know where you're looking to build. But right now is a, I, the best time to break ground really is about two to three weeks ago uh, in my neck of the woods and maybe about a month, month and a half ago in most other areas of the country. If you're looking to break ground next year, as soon as that, if you're in snow, as soon as that snow is gone, you break ground. Even if it's muddy, it's a great time because you don't want to get your finished pushed up too much into the next year. In the end of the next year. So, David B. asks, uh, welcome, Herschel. Thanks for being on the channel. David asks, I've seen excavator videos where they cleared a building area of trees, digging up the roots, then digging a, a pit outside the building area, burning their roots and covering up the ashes. A bad idea? Yeah. Uh, you do not want any organic matter inside or near where the pad of the building is going to go. A lot of the best geotechs I've ever spoken to said nothing bigger than the pinky of your finger. But I've seen some that don't even want to see like hair follicle size organic matter. I've got a job up north and I was there with the um, geotech when we did some, some test pits. We went down three feet and he says, Keith, I'm still seeing capillaries. Capillaries are roots that reached down and then during a dry season, the roots died, but they left that organic matter down there. And it was filled with capillaries. And he says, Keith, we're going to have to call for a five foot over act because we had to get down that deep below all the root structure and then recompact it with water for a 95% compaction test. Well, if you have ash in there or any kind of organic matter, you may be able to compact it. But as that starts to decay more and more over time, it's going to eventually going to want to compact some more. But that's after the house is built. And then you're going to have cracking in your foundation and concrete. This is how important proper excavation and, and following the geotech report. Those guys have to be eye to eye on everything. And when you dig down, you're going to see you can dig down two feet and there's no organic matter there at all. You could down five feet and you're going to see all kinds of organic matter. Depends on how loose that soil was for millennia or even decades. And if it was very loose and it had a lot of moisture, you're going to find all, like you people that build out east with all your oak trees, those oak trees have a taproot. They want to go straight down, straight down. And you have to dig, oh, it's, it can be a real nightmare. Versus if you're going to build on a parcel with just aspen trees. Aspen trees are roots that are just very shallow and they're really on the surface. You go down two feet and you're not going to find any more roots. Uh, they're, they're really on the on the surface, kind of like a, um, a rainforest. A lot of those trees are really on the surface area. They're not really digging down. So knowing your geology, knowing the organic matter down below, those are really important things. Uh, and don't, don't put them off. Uh, Pennsylvania, yeah, Pennsylvania. Yeah, you got a lot of... Uh, a lot of organic matter out that way. A lot of green growth out there in, in, in Pennsylvania. I, I've done some videos. I did a video, um, I think about a month or two ago. Actually, no, it hasn't even been published. Uh, I did this and it's been recorded. It's in post-production right now. And the, the biggest areas you can save happens to be the general contractor fee, if you can avoid a general contractor, and the excavation costs. All right. right away on just about any home that's close to three hundred fifty dollars or $400,000, right away you can save at the bare minimum $75,000, if not more, depending upon what the geology is like. Those are your biggest costs. Right there, those are the two biggest costs on building a home combined when you combine them. I've seen excavation um, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars and some that's come in at twenty dollars or 30000 
But if you got big excavation costs, um, I'd make friends with with somebody who knows how to drive that equipment. And even if you rented it, you'd be better off. Uh, or buy it and then sell it when you're done. Or buy it, learn how to fix it, learn how to operate it over a weekend. It's just like, you know, art, or, or what do you call those? Video games. You're learning how to use stuff. And you get on, it's like a car. You know, you picked up a car pretty quick on a weekend. You pick up that heavy equipment on a good long Saturday. And pretty soon you're moving dirt. You're digging. You know what? You just have to know what to do. And a geology report can actually help you with that. They'll tell you how much they need to dig down and what you need to do with the soil. And if you need to do one foot lift or two foot lifts or six inch lifts or wh whatever you need to do. But that's to me is I'm not, I don't like finished carpentry. <laughs> Some builders love it. They just love the detail. I love the big stuff. I love the things that I can save the biggest amount of money. And that's the general contractor fee. And of course this excavation. And I, I got off the roof. I got off of doing a lot of stuff inside the homes. Got off of framing. Got away from that. Now I just do excavation on jobs. All right. I even haul off trash. And I save a, but a, a quite a bit of money on hauling off trash. I can spend five to seven thousand dollars with a local uh, dump company that has a dump, a six yarder. They dump off right at the house. Well, I just drop off my dump trailer. Because I'm going to go see the job anyway, and it's on the way to the dump, I just pick it up. I just pick it up and take it to the dump, and and the dump fee is like 30 bucks, and then I charge my clients a little gas fee, so it, I'm incorporating that in with a lot of my costs. I don't do that with every job, but I, I weigh it. I weigh the pros and cons of it. It's going to help me. Is it is it within my time frame? Can I do it? If it's my own job, for sure I do that. I, I get a little trailer, and I go to the dump. I go to the dump a lot. <laughs> I go to the dump probably three to four times a week, you know, trying to save some costs, uh, especially if it was my own job, I'd be getting a trailer. Um, question here from SM Build. In Southern California, can you break ground any time of the year or should you avoid January, February rainy season? No, you can break it down any time. Really, I know that area pretty well. Uh, if you've got a lot of rain, because you've got a lot of what's called shale soil, and it, it absorbs water pretty well. It doesn't puddle. If you've got a clay soil, that's you're going to turn into a mud bog. It's going to be nasty. But not so much a lot of the soils that you have. But even so, I wouldn't worry about it. You don't, you're not going to get that much rain in January and February. If you watch the weather, they can come in and dig, get it out, and recompact it if there's any recompaction required, and have that thing ready pretty quickly. So I wouldn't worry about it. It's the freezing climates. <laughs> where the ground literally is frozen for two feet and you're trying to get down below what might be a permafrost, like northern North Dakota or even northern Idaho, Coeur d'Alene up there, Montana, further northern areas, even higher altitude areas. That's where you're really, the snow will just pummel you. It will just make it really hard. That's why I always tell people, if you're going to build and you have a, a snowy environment, four seasons, you want to have that shell done before that winter time comes, which is why I said if you're going to break ground and you've got the four seasons, breaking ground in the spring as early as you can in the spring is ideal, if not not later than the middle of September, so that you can break ground, get the foundation done, get the framing structure done, and get it protected before you know late December, even before late November. These are things you have to think about if you can be ahead of the schedule. Uh, David asks, how many spots do they typically do for geotech reports for a home with a basement? Uh, does it make sense to test a larger area in case you need to nudge your building's location? They will typically do it in two to three areas, but they will not do it inside the footprint of the home. They're going to try to stay close to the footprint of the home, but not inside the footprint. There's reasons for that. They don't want to be responsible for weakening soil inside the footprint of the home. Okay, so for example, if you dig a big pit for a test pit and you go down 14 feet and you lightly put it in there, you don't really compact it because these geotechs aren't going to recompact it foot on foot on foot and have it tested every foot. And they've got a big, you know, if it's a, that's why there are a lot of them are using core samples. 
they drill it with a core sample. I'm not a fan of the core sample. I like the backhoe. Because with the backhoe, I can get in and I can literally see the strata. But most geologists are going to do a core sample to be two, three inches wide. And then they can do that anywhere within the footprint of the home. So typically three. Three is probably a good number. If it's a 6,000 square foot home, maybe more. Uh, I've done that. I've been there on the job site. And I've watched them drill. And I've watched them dig. And I've asked them. I'm kind of worried. Can you can you do another test pit over here? And he did on a job. And luckily, I had him do that because we saw a massive strata of volcanic rock just 20 feet away, just a massive, huge amount of compacted compressed. It was almost like granite. It was like an older igneous rock, and it was really brutal. So we shifted the home, but we still couldn't avoid all of it. So we structured and redesigned the whole basement so we didn't have to cut out that huge amount of rock. But luckily I saw it. We caught it in advance, changed a a few things, and as a result, we were able to move through the build without running into it later on when we didn't want to run into it we were able to solve for it so they'll typically do three core samples and they'll go down 20 feet on a core sample but on a backhoe they'll go down anywhere from 12 to 15 feet i've got my own track and i can get down 14 feet so that's just fine enough for that but if you have a lot of organic matter and you really want to see how deep that root structure is it's not a bad thing to have a backhoe come in and dig down 12 feet and have them do a test pit. Just keep in mind, you don't want that test pit inside the footprint of the home. It can weaken that whole structure, and you may not have any guarantee that there's any proper uh, compaction in that area. That's a big issue. I've, I talked with a builder a long time ago, and um, he had a slab on grade, and he only had to go down three feet. But it cracked in one area, and he found out that that's where the test pit was. It was a big, huge five-foot area, and they didn't properly compact that. So underneath that that slab, and it cracked. And so these are things you just, <laughs> I could tell you story after story when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing to do um, with, um, I want to talk about um, lumber right now. And a lot of people have asked me this question, and it has to do with, can I go with two foot on center or should I go with 16 feet or 16 inches on center? You can go either way. Literally, the code allows you to put two by sixes, two feet on center, and even two by fours on center that are up to two feet apart. I'm not a fan of that. It makes the house a little rickety. I built a two by four home. It's the first home I built a long time ago. And when the front door shut, it just rattled the entire home. Uh, I live in a, a old pioneer home that's a super thick wall. And even my Omniblock remodel in the back, and I don't have that rattling near as much as I had on that 2 by 4 wall. And if I went two feet on center just to save some money, um, I'm gonna, that whole, it's going to be like a, like a card box just to just rattle. But here's the only place you would want to do that is if you're in Canada or Alaska or in a very, very, very cold environment because wood is a terrible insulator. And if you're eliminating a lot of the wood structure, you're stuffing in more insulation. And then that adds to the the efficiency of the home. Something to think about. I've had a lot of emails that's been asking me that, that very question on that. So question here. Um, from Colin, what's the best way to schedule your build for maximum time efficiency? We're at 9,000 feet and have a limited time from frame to work within. Oh, yes. Very, very good question. I've been knocking on the door to build homes in a ski resort area that's going in, and they're going to be at 10,500 feet, 1,500 feet higher than you. And I'm looking to get a meeting with the developer of that project so I can get in there. You're going to be building in the snow at some time because at that high altitude, you're going to be running into, you've got maybe three months, two months to three months of nice summer weather. Then it's going to start getting cold and that cold is going to affect your ability to paint concrete, all the stuff that requires water to apply or mix or or do whatever it is. So in that environment, there's two ways to do this. 
you either break ground as early in the spring as you can, and you have to do it when there's mud there. You can't wait for everything to dry, because if you do, you're going to wait for another three weeks until things kind of get dry, and then you're going to deal with rain and whatnot. You're, no matter which, which way you look at it, you're going to deal with rain, and you're going to deal with some possible additional snow. Earlier you can break ground, the better. And then, or if that is too bothersome and you don't want to deal with mud in early spring, what you can do is you can break ground in the fall, like um, late July, early middle of August, even as late as mid-September. If you can get that, if the dirt work, a lot of the dirt work is done, you can do your foundation work, get that done in say August, get your framing done in September, and then November, or October comes around, you get the frame all up in a whole month if you can, get it shelled and protected and papered and, and, and dried in on the roof. Then you're looking at during the winter, it's sealed up so mechanical guys can come in, your plumbing, your electrical, your HVAC guys can come in. And when they're all done, guess what? You can put insulation in, have it inspected. You can do a lot of things protected from the elements. It's all a matter of that three month window that you have to get excavation, concrete, and framing done. Those are your three big ones. And if you can do it early in the spring, great. That means that you're gonna have some time in the late fall, even November, where you can actually start getting finished work. Here's something to think about. Painters cannot install or paint if it's too cold. They need heat. But if you can do it, and if you can get to that painting time in say, you know, September, or even July, then you're not gonna have that expensive cost of heating that whole home during that time. Same thing with concrete. And if you're, here's something else to think about. You wanna think about when to start and when to finish. Finished concrete does, does not like cold weather. It's not fun, all right? And they have to put accelerator into the concrete just so it starts to set up fast enough. And it's the same thing with paint, does not like cold. So if you can if you can do those at, at a finish time in the spring or summer when it's warm, great. That means you got to break ground in the in the fall in October or September, so you can time it out for it. Just keep in mind the average owner builder is about nine months of build time. If you're really on on top of it, you can do it in six months. But time it from the start of the nine months to the end of that. But give yourself extra extra padding. Yeah. I I like to break ground in the fall on just about every job, even if it's in a high temp, I High altitudes because if I get the structure done and I race to get it done before the holidays I've got a shell st structure protected then I've got January February March to get all this the guts done and as spring comes guess what warmer weathers I can do finish work on the outside concrete work I can do painting inside and outside without any inclement weather holding that back and do drywall tape and texture again without really cold weather making that a nightmare so save your finish for the best weather you can and then race to get your framing done in the, in the winter and all that. I could talk forever on that, but that's, that's a good question. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's see here. We got, uh, we're, we're going to end there because I've got some people I need to talk to, people that are, this is a networking event that we are hosting. Again, this is a really neat networking event. It's a, it's a career fair, not even a career fair. It's an entrepreneur fair rather than a job fair. And this is how I network. We, we created our own networking organization locally. It's how I meet a lot of really, really neat people. And if you're interested, go to localcommonwealth.com. If you feel like you're building your own home for your community, once you for your own family, once you build your own home, I want you to think about building community because that's the really next step because you're going to preserve all that energy you put into that home. Don't think that you're going to be an isolationist or you're not going to be part of your community. You want to be part of your community. That's what makes your home living so much better. So you can go to localcommonwealth.com. Check it out. Go to the uh, info packet. There's a button there that says info packet. Check that out. Read the history of business networking. Uh, it goes all the way back to Benjamin Franklin and all the way through what's happened over the past 100, 250 years. Really, really good information. Check it out. This is what we've created here locally with my wife and I. It's called Local Commonwealth. Our first chapter is called the Dixie Business Network. 
And this is what the Dixie Business Network is. We're, we're networking here. But you guys are welcome. Uh, we'll check chime in next week. Again, save your questions for then. We'll, we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Thanks for everyone for chiming on. Make sure you like, subscribe, do all that. Share with your friends. We'd appreciate that. You guys take care and have a great weekend.